Hey everyone, first of all, a very happy International Women's Day. Yesterday I had a chat to Della Dajerdi, an amazing internationally acclaimed poet and spoken word artist. We were chatting about Maisie Eddy, who's somewhat a forgotten voice in literature, but is gradually being remembered more and more. We're always looking for role models and inspirational thoughts to guide us through life. I came across Maisie Eddy in early 2020 when I was investigating uh, key figures in Arab female literature. To sum up her vision, which I very much relate to, uh, this is a quote from one of her later diaries a few years before she passed away. I love you the East. My soul is yours. I love the West as well. I love humanity and its true meaning. I have compassion for its pain and its mistakes, and I believe in God. Something that really fascinated me about Maisie Ade was the fact that she wrote a lot in French. Um, in fact, her first published collection of poems, uh, Fleur de Rêve, was all in French, and she published it under the pen name of Isis Copier. Mm -hmm. I'm really fascinated in the fact that she chose to express her creativity in another language and also not attach her own name to it. What do you think was the reason for this? Well, um, Maisie was educated in French, mm -hmm. so it was a, a very strong language for her, mm -hmm. and I think it was a language in which she felt like liberated to express herself. And she I felt think connected to her ideals through that. That's right, and I think also the 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 idea of a nom de guerre of a pen name mm -hmm. uh, was more common in France. And so to take a pen name, which would give her like ultimate liberty to express exactly what it is that she wanted to express without uh, any kind of shame or any kind of um, sense of um, like indebtedness to her mm. parents or to her religion or to her culture, um, but really having the permission to really say what she wanted to say. Um, writing in French gave her that. What was her relationship with religion? Um, there's actually a passage in here that I read the other night, which I thought would be really interesting to share. Religion does not have anything to do with our wars today. Yes, people open wars in the name of God and ask him for support and play the hypocrite with him, he who is above hypocrisy, saying, you are our God, until when they have put an end to a life God gave life to, and have destroyed homes and torn apart bodies and crushed hearts, they return to their churches and temples and fall on their knees, praying to the exalted God, the God of mercy, love, and compassion, and reciting the following, O oh God, we exalt you. I know Maisie Addo had a love for solitude, and I think... This was sort of fostered in part in her childhood. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a bit about like how how this was the case? So uh, Meziada's mother was from Nasra, from Nazareth mm -hmm. in Palestine, and her dad was a Maronite from Lebanon, and uh, she grew up uh, in Nasra in part and mm -hmm. uh, other parts in Lebanon, and she attended a, um, a school run by a nunnery. And um, unfortunately, her parents couldn't, you know, pick her up on holidays. And so it seemed that you know, on those holidays, she would spend time alone in the nunnery. And so books became her companions. Yeah. And letter yeah. writing was automatically a way to stay in touch with her family and to kind of keep track of all of the ideas and concepts that she was being introduced to through these books. So from a very young age, she was quite accustomed to solitude, as you say, and, um, and I think really happy and independently yeah. so. At what point did she begin to gain recognition in the literary world? So after she graduated, she joined her parents in Cairo. Her dad was there. Um, he was the editor of a newspaper. And so automatically she had links into the literary world, um, mostly from the perspective of politics and journalism, but these are the people who would be in her family home, uh, sharing dinner and sharing meals with her, her parents. Um, and then at some point, uh, she had read The Broken Wings by mm -hmm. Gibran Khalil Gibran. She actually read an excerpt of it uh, out loud, and everyone was astounded by 
the quality in which she spoke mm -hmm. and how she was quite fearless in front of the masses. Wow. And so this was like a debut moment from, for her. And after that, she decided to host a weekly literary salon that was every Tuesday. Wow, she, she, she gained great recognition for these literary salons in Cairo and they're frequented by a lot of very um, well-established people. A lot of these men would fall in love with her. Mm -hmm. um, but she loved only one man in her life, um, the infamous Khalil Gibran. Mm -hmm. um, they maintained a 20-year or so correspondence. Yeah. What was the nature of the correspondence? She originally wrote to him after reading The Broken Wings, and yeah. this is what started their, their correspondence. And um, She obviously found the beauty in his thought. Definitely, and I think that she admired him and really perceived that the man that Gibran wrote about in The Prophet and the likes is the quality of character of the man who, who she's speaking to. When in reality, Gibran Khalil Gibran was a very nuanced character. Um, he, he did write about um, great qualities and merits in his literature, but did he embody all of them all the time? No, uh, he definitely wasn't a saint, you yeah. know. In, in the States, he was living Eugene with a woman. Cesar. Yeah, right. Living with a woman and, and uh, sleeping with another and, uh, you know, <laughs> was constantly drunk and, you know, really had no desire to come back to May, even though what you would be able to discern from his writing to her is that he did love her, but I think that he idealized her yeah. of this, like woman in my beloved country, you know, like a virgin in the village kind of situation. But did he yeah. actually do anything to try and be with her? And I think that in reading his letters, because his letters to me are published in a book called The Blue Flame. And what about her letters to him? No, her letters to him were revoked by her, her family state. They held on to her letters. So unfortunately, we um, have far more access to his letters to her, but if you study his letters to her, you can see that um, there would be periods of time where May would not write to him. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, oh, it's been years since I've heard from you. And what I <laughs> gathered from this was, you know, like he writes of this really lofty admiration and love and respect. And yet, you know, culture and custom of the time is not so different than it is now, you know? It, it would have required that he come to make an advance to her. Yeah. Not that she crossed the ocean to go in and find him in the US. And her love for Gibran was also the sort of mystical, um, very romantic and not physical mm. love. And it was it was quite unique in the fact that they never met each other at all. But they never met, but I think that she originally saw in him what could be like a, like a match, an artistic, literary match. Like, yeah. this is a person who has qualities that I aspire to achieve, or at least that she thought at the time when they first started to, to write, and that they could be this, like, what we would refer to today as a power couple, you know? They could be yeah, this and they brought couple. out great qualities in each other in the writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, eventually when I read enough of these letters, I was like, okay, hold up. He does not know who she is. Do I know who she is? And I realized that there were many other letters on May's desk besides the letters of Gibran Khalil Gibran. Mm -hmm. Because part of her, her literary salon was to create an uh, epistolary culture. Yeah. And which is a culture based on exchange of letters. Mm -hmm. And so anyone who was in conversation during the salon would continue the conversation through a series of letters. Mm -hmm. And these letters were private and yet open letters, public facing letters. Mm -hmm. And anyone knew that their letter could be read by hundreds of people, uh, let alone just the person who the letter was intended for. And so it was a really interesting way to straddle the private life and the public life and to open open it up in a social way to more and more people to tune into these thoughts so that they could also participate in the discussion. Maisie Ade really wanted an equal society. She advocated for education for all women so that women could be liberated mm -hmm. intellectually, just like she'd been. What were distinct about her ideals of feminism? 
I think it was a movement at the time, and she was definitely part of this movement. Yeah. But one of the things that she would advocate for was um, the presence of women in uh, social ceremony or civil ceremonies. Mm -hmm. For example, a funeral. Yeah. Uh, so, so one of the ways that she, she reached out after, I believe, at Zaghloul's funeral, women were not in attendance, and she wrote a letter of condolence that ended up being an open letter, a public letter, through which, in this letter, she had addressed, you know, why are women allowed to go to plays, and yet we're not allowed to mourn, when we are the, the, the sex that birthed the deceased, and partnered him, and mothered him, and, you know, so she constantly found ways also uh, in terms of education. She really advocated for women's education, saying that the mother is the one who educates a society. Um, and, uh, and then also holding, uh, you know, views that we might um, not question, but think are, are interesting in our day and age. She, she advocated beauty. So a sheikh once wrote her a letter saying, you know, I think that women spend too much time on their looks and appearances. And she, she advocated at some time, but it's a woman's right to beautify and make things beautiful. And, mm -hmm. and how, how many of us, you know, can stand to be in a home that, you know, beauty wasn't sought in, in this yeah. space. Um, so education, a woman's role in society, uh, being able to travel without, mm -hmm. uh, without a male figure around. All of these were things that she she advocated for. Yeah, I'm really fascinated by her sense of her sense of place, her sense of almost placelessness. That having lived across several different countries, mm -hmm. um, it's it's quite clear in her work. She has a she has a deep attachment to different places of home. Um, there's a poem, "Goodbye Lebanon," mm -hmm. where she's just she's just leaving Lebanon at that point. My soul is sometimes wild and egret flying far beyond the ocean's edge, and sometimes I curl up like an anemone when touched, damp for delicate sea foam tears. Fading from sight, you're a dream that ends, but grief goes on. Goodbye, my nest. The sense of travelling beyond her home, the mm -hmm. sense of like constantly having to be forced to look out, but even if it's like not actually her choice. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of nationality, what, what, what do you think she'd have um, defined herself as? Would she define herself as Palestinian, Lebanese, um, Egyptian, you know? I think she w would be like um, a pan-Arab nationalist, you yes. know? This is really the sense that I got from her, is that she's beyond Palestinian and beyond Lebanese and beyond yeah. Egyptian. She's all of them and more. And, and very European also in yes. her education and her mannerisms and her, her perspective. It was really hard actually trying to get hold of Ziade's work. I basically couldn't find any. Yeah. It was as if she was erased from history. Why did this happen and how did it happen? So unfortunately, uh, many men who showed up to her salon were infatuated by her. Right. Um, it is unfortunate because when that love was not reciprocated, the response to that unrequited love was aggression, was demeaning, was uh, finding a way to disqualify and discredit her. That came out in a million different ways. So when she had rejected those who, you know, advanced her advanced her advanced on her Let them. Made, made an <laughs> made advance a move. <laughs> made a move when she rejected them uh, rumors came out that she was a lesbian that she was very weak that she didn't love anyone including Gibran that she was selfish that she was you know any all, all of these attempts to degrade her reputation yeah. and to disqualify her and eventually you know all of those who were around her with the deep longing that one day she will look upon them the way they looked upon her <laughs> eventually were Funny scorned going. <laughs> Funny going about it, but yeah. right yeah. yeah they're like in the friend zone waiting yeah. to make their move right so eventually they were scorned and they they moved on and they really abandoned her yeah 
And um, unfortunately, uh, what followed was a, a series of years that were very difficult for Meziade. I believe it was first that her father died mm. and she was very close to her parents. Of course, she was an only child. And then Gibran died and then her mother died. So the three in a row, year upon year, passed away and she was mourning. She was grieving their loss and she was very heartbroken. And at some point she left and she went to Italy to try and change the, the scene around her and, and give herself new perspective. And uh, her cousin in Lebanon reached out to her and said, cousin, come home, let's take care of you. But actually when she arrived back in Lebanon, he had her uh, admitted into the Asfuriye, which is a mental asylum. And he had her admitted so that he could become the, uh, the ward of her family's estate. And so she was in Al Asfuriye for a few years. She was in there for a couple of years and nobody knew because she had kind of, there had been this like collapse of all of the romantic illusions followed by the deaths of her parents and Gibran where she had withdrawn mm -hmm. and then nobody knew that she ended up in this um, in this mental asylum and uh, and eventually someone did find out and appealed for them to release her what they did was they relocated her into the AUB uh, medical center and then from the AUB medical center they said if she is to be released she must make a public address and the public will decide whether she's of sound mind fit to re-enter society. And so after two years of being in this uh, hospital with no appeals and no release, she had aged vis visibly, you know, with wiry white hair and just sunken eyes. And I think her spirit had really been crushed and her like belief in humanity. And I feel like when you realize that you gave so much mm. and, and there was no one there to give to you in your time of need, I can imagine how destructive that feeling and that reality can be. So she came out and she was a very different person. She gave, As anyone would say. She spent a couple more months in, in Lebanon before returning to Cairo. And she died within a few years of returning to Cairo, I think really her spirit had been destroyed well before she got back to Cairo. Yeah, unfortunately, there were only three people who walked in her janazah, yeah. in her funeral. This is someone who, who stirred the city of Cairo, you know? Yeah. And we have to wonder why. Why? Why was she such a threat? How can we honor her legacy, do you think, today? Well, I would say definitely read as much as you can about her because mm -hmm. when I started looking in 2014 versus today, there's way more information yeah. today about her than there was published even just five, six years ago. Um, but also... It only took a century and a bit. But <laughs> yeah. But also, you know, if we can find the opportunity to translate her work, mm -hmm. um, then that would make her work way more accessible. Um, and uh, I, I know how you're feeling about not having access to her work. The only access that I had to her work was when I was in Lebanon to research about her and found in certain yeah, bookshops for the play. For the play yeah. yeah, I found certain bookshops uh, her her works in Arabic, but but now to translate them into English, into French, into Italian, into German, into Turkish, which is the languages that she translated works yeah. into and that yeah. she wrote in. I think would be an amazing way to keep her legacy alive.